So welcome again. This is Stan Hosford with the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. We are interviewing today with Dr. Mark Bozzato. He has uh, given us an article on uh, the difference between mercury-free and mercury-safe dentistry. And uh, we're going to go in depth uh, with a whole bunch about that. So uh, welcome, Dr. Bozzato. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. We... Uh, we were uh, acquainted back in the day when uh, we were. I was doing the Point of Light magazine. You were one of our advertisers way back, way back then, back uh, in the aughts, as they say. Back in the day. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> so I uh, really appreciate you joining our new effort. Uh, our new issue uh, of the magazine is out. Uh, it's got food on the cover, and uh, right inside is your smiling picture uh, and a nice, uh, really informative article about uh, the difference between mercury-free and mercury-safe dentistry. So uh, let's get into that a little bit. Uh, as you say, anybody, any dentist can take mercury out of your mouth, um, but there's really only uh, there's really only a few, well, there's several ways you have to prepare to do it safely. You want to expand upon that a little bit? Well, that, that's exactly right. Um, but uh, forgive this surprise, Fen, but before we get into the, oh. the topic du jour, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I want to commend you uh, for two things. One, one is your interview with uh, Colin Campbell. Um, wow, what, what a uh, man in the forefront of uh, nutritional science. Whether, whether you uh, one agrees with the man or not, he put himself out there in, in a very significant way. Uh, so, uh, congratulations, because uh, I, I know he does an interview with, with uh, just anybody. And the second thing with, with that in mind is that, you know, being on the forefront, uh, alternative practitioners, we expose ourselves. Um, and we have our important work to do, but you're getting this information out there to, to the masses is, I believe, every bit as important. So I, I just want to applaud you uh, uh, for being in the alternative medical promotion business, if that's what you call it. Well, you, you know, it's funny because I don't even like to think of it as alternative. Uh, it's um, it's natural. It's what works. It's it's functional. I mean, functional medicine is now a term being used. Uh, it's integrative. It's complementary. It's it's all the stuff. It's self-care. Really, it's about self-care. Uh, it's the things that we all should know. These are the things our doctors should be teaching us, telling us, keeping us informed about. And uh, just because of the system, even doctors that want to do it the correct way and really want to inform their clients don't have the time, don't have any way to be reimbursed for it. Uh, or, uh, you know, so it's really up to us to get the word out there and... Uh, people informed and, and and keep pushing the real science because uh, as they say in the in the movie uh, you know the truth has a way of uh, not going away right? I can't remember how they phrase it but uh, the truth always sticks around well well put and actually what we're talking about here is tribal knowledge mm -hmm. that this is the knowledge that sustained our ancestors tens tens of thousands of years ago uh, in order to have one more generation. This was medicine as it, as it was practiced before, back in the day. Right. So. Yeah, so this is, and it's an interesting crossover now for what you're doing in the whole area of uh, getting mercury out of your mouth, because uh, I'll, I'll wind us back to the topic again here. Um, you really do uh, have, uh, you know, the nutritional support is the, the very first thing that's uh, on the list of, of, of things to uh, to be safe about when you're taking mercury out. Well, you, yes. Uh, supporting a, a person's physiology. It's it's the Virchow uh, Pasteur argument. It's, it's the host. You support the host. And uh, Pasteur, you know, he, he accepted that on his deathbed. And uh, Virchow was was right. You support the host that can deal with more. Our miracle, the miracle of our immune system is what gets us healthy. Natural practitioners know best, I believe, how to position a person's body so it can heal better, faster, more completely. 
Well, you know what? I, and I'm, as I'm sitting here listening to that, I'm, I'm wondering maybe we should even start with uh, why mercury is dangerous and why you need to get it out and what arguments can I have when I go see my 72-year-old dentist and he tells me, ah, it's perfectly safe. I've been doing it for 50 years. What's the good arguments there? Well, and the problem is you're going to get the same arguments from uh, a, a 27-year-old dentist who's been practicing six months uh, and all, all the allopathic dentists in between. The unfortunately, this has been politicized. So, and what I mean by that is that the dental scientists are no longer just looking at the science of it. Um, the American Dental Association holds the patent on amalgam. Um, it's taught in medical school or dental school that it's it's okay that the mercury vapor released is not enough to cause disease in the human being. We are talking about a neurotoxin and it's been known as a neurotoxin for centuries. Well, in the 1800s, it was the toxic waste of the time. It was the radiated, you know, the high, the most highly uh, toxic thing that they had in their society in the 1800s. Well, yes. Uh, the it was noteworthy back then because it was one of the few known toxic mm -hmm. substances today there's a plethora of, of toxins that we have to deal with well i i think you, you you dropped a bombshell on me i didn't even realize this you say the ada the american dentistry association the dental association holds the patent on amalgam using mercury Yes. They are the ones who, for as long as they've existed and as long as they've held the patent, presumably, been saying that it's perfectly safe. So I always assumed they didn't want to change their stand because they would have to backtrack 140 years of dental history or whatever it is. But now they hold the patent. They're directly liable if there's any links made in a court between mercury and and diseases. Has there been any court battles that you know of? Actually, they're they're not liable. They've not. they've positioned themselves, uh, and the American Dental Association is a trade union. Union. Right. It's right. it's not a government agency. That's right. And it uh, they've made it clear, and and they did this, I believe, back in the early nineteen nineties that the dentist was left to his or her own devices in recommending any material. Now, this came out when the American Dental Association had to concede that all of the mercury was not bound by the amalgam. The amalgam's a mixture. It's, there, there's, there's no chemical binding of the elements. There's 50% liquid mercury, elemental mercury, combined with uh, silver, zinc, copper, tin, and it's mixed together. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's uh, dispensed as a putty, and it, it will fill void. So uh, when the, the, the genesis of this was that this material to use, it was cheap. Frenchman in the let's say it was the mid 1800s and the the dental association that was established in the United States at that time um, said we're not using this material because it has a neurotoxin in it <laughs> but what happened with the member dentist was that they wanted to use the cheap stuff because that's what the consumer wanted and the consumer didn't understand. So there, there was this disregard for the science and the, when, when the majority of the dentists decided to use amalgam, they formed their own dental association, the American Dental Association that exists today. So that's how it came about was 
so that dentists could use this mercury filling. Yes, but the, the, the story has a layer of irony to it. And that is that the established dental association back in the mid 1800s, when, when they saw that mercury was gonna overtake them, they referred to the users of mercury as quacks. <laughs> And the, the term quack is derived from the German word for elemental mercury, quarksilver, what? quicksilver, quack. And that's been turned around 150 uh, years later. And it's, it's just one of those paradoxes that, uh, of, of life. When you get old enough, it's okay. Here comes another one of those. And here I thought the whole thing about quacks was something to do about ducks. I really <laughs> yes. Well. Where that term came from. <laughs> oh man, because you're you're out squawking. A, a never mind. Let's go into something else. That, that just blows my mind. Um, so, so Sven, uh, I, I was telling you back in uh, around 1993-1994, the American uh, Dental Association had to concede that the mercury was not chemically bound. Yeah. That, right. that mercury vapor escaped. Now, I remember you showing us the slide uh, when the first time I saw your presentation on this, and you had a picture, a, mic a microscopic picture of a 25 year old filling, and it still was leaching mercury. You could see drops of mercury on the side. Do I remember that correctly? Yes, and the the the, the video, uh, the the video science that proved that the vapor existed was was done in 93 or 94 and the American Dental Association changed their uh, their ethics law to prevent anyone from speaking about the, the the release of the vapor and prevented any dentist from suggesting to uh, a, a, a patient that their mercury or their filling should be removed because it has a neurotoxin in it. So they they wanted Doc Dennis not to talk about that. Yes. Yeah. So what 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 we do is I can't I can't tell. Now in today I'm exercising my First Amendment right of free speech. Right. Yeah. We're here on a broadcast. You don't have a patient in front of you. And and that that was tested in court uh, and uh, a, a New England area dentist was totally beat up, um, drained of finances, career ruined, but he, he won and God bless him. He won the right for uh, any uh, uh, alternative practicing dentist to, to talk to someone like you, like I am today. No. Well, it's a shame that you're even considered alternative. I mean, you're by the terms of, what's happening in the, the rest of medicine, you're a functional dentist. You're talking about the functionality of food as medicine and the whole understanding of the toxic load that we're under and providing ways to lessen that burden. So I, I kind of bristle at the, the idea that you're alternative. I think you're, you should be the mainstream. <laughs> should be, yes. Another one of those paradoxes. Yeah, yeah. They call you the quack and you're the one get the quark silver out of them, out of the people's yeah. mouth. Most, most human biochemists and most human physiologists would, would agree that there is no biological reason for mercury in the body. Yeah. There's no benefit. It conversely uh, expresses itself in a lot of dastardly ways. In yeah. the body, it's it's it, uh, it it affects the central nervous system. It it affects the uh, elementary canal. It it affects um, uh, uh, organs and organ systems. And it interferes with enzyme symptoms, um, and it does this. And the World Health Organization, I think, back in 1991. Um, voiced that that a person's primary exposure to mercury vapor was from dental work. 
not from not from fish not from fish and well here in western pennsylvania we've got a lot of coal fired plants that are putting mercury into the air uh, upwind of us so yes we have one of the highest concentrations of mercury in our breathing air as well yes so, so how, i'm sorry how do, would would some of those symptoms when you talk about neurological and and uh, all those sorts of things is particularly the alimentary canal what would that manifest as how what symptoms would i experience that would make me think i might be having uh too much mercury in my system wish that it worked that way sven wow. they the, the the symptoms are are legion they're all over the board and they affect every one of us differently and it's subtly because this isn't this this this, this is a low dose long-term exposure and it depends on the quality of a person's immune system. I wish that upon exposure to mercury, everyone's right earlobe would turn purple. <laughs> It'd be a no-brainer. But but it's it's the antithesis of that. So, so someone someone could have diarrhea, and they've done everything, and no one can figure out why. Well, it, it could be the mercury. The mercury interferes with the microbiota of the elementary canal. And so it could have that consequence. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, um, wow, that's really depressing now. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, I can see why that's also the, the difficulty in tying this legally, uh, mercury, to any diseases because it's... Um, because of its, it, it, like you say, it, it could be any kind of thing. And until I would think the only way you can determine if mercury is the cause is when you take it out, does those, do those symptoms go away? Is that what happens when you, when you remove the fillings from people's heads? No. Re re removing the fillings could make it worse if the patient isn't protected. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because they're going to get an acute exposure to mercury vapor and and some would get an exposure in excess of what OSHA and the EPA deems as as safe the um, in in that presentation all those years ago that you referred to I was citing and anyone can see this video either at my website Nutridentist.com or on YouTube. It's called the smoking teeth video mm. and it shows with special backlighting the release of the mercury vapor um, on a 25 year old amalgam on an extracted tooth mm. and the, the doctor presenter he rubs an eraser to simulate a tooth cleaning and more more mercury vapor wafts off and he, he, he scrapes a knife against it to, to stimulate the drill. And there, there, there's just a ton of the mercury vapor uh, that's released. So uh, any dentist knows how to remove a mercury filling. It's done every day. What shouldn't be done is be unprotected and then have another mercury filling placed. There's another dentist that say they're, they're mercury free. They don't place amalgam fillings, but they're oblivious to the functional reasons, the biochemical and physiological reasons for protecting their patient. And then there's dentists like myself who are mercury safe. We treat the mercury filling as a neurotoxin. We treat it very seriously because we understand the adverse impact on the patient. So the, uh, the protocol uh, that I follow uh, is uh, according to the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, an organization that has been around since I believe 1987 and they review the uh, protocol all the time. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I've added a step to the protocol uh, since I wrote the article, um, which um, is having my patient 
swish and swallow a slurry of um, of um, uh, food grade uh, carbon uh, carbon powder. This coats uh, the tongue, the, all the tissues in the mouth, and when they swallow it, it protects the alimentary canal. Wow. So, um, but but Sven, how how this works is uh, the 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 vapor. You can't see it, you can't smell it. So it's like carbon monoxide, only it's gonna kill you differently from carbon monoxide. Uh, it's gonna take decades for that to happen and you're, you're gonna function, your, 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 your ability to function is, is gonna diminish and, and you're not gonna understand why. But 80% of the vapor is absorbed in the lungs the rest is uh, it's it's either ingested with a swallow or it's absorbed through the uh, the oral mucosa, the the, the gums and and, and the, uh, the the tongue and the tissue. The immune system, the colon, kidney, um, liver, and sweat glands are doing everything they can to avoid what winds up in the blood, goes to the lungs, gets into the blood, and over a 24-hour period. The body's trying to avoid it. Well, if the influx of the vapor exceeds the physiological capacity of the immune system to avoid it, then you get what's called a bioaccumulation, a buildup. And mercury, it's so widely used in industry because it combines with everything, primarily sulfur. And there, there's sulfur used um, as part of the enzymatic processes, but it will bind with anything. So it will go deep into cells. Now, you ask me, will someone get better once their amalgams are removed? Even when they're safely removed, what, what has been accomplished is that person's primary exposure to the neurotoxin has been eliminated. They need to be detoxed right. in order for them to experience the health benefit. Now, some people, some with the most severe symptoms, just by the fact that they're no longer exposed, these people have reported some miraculous things. Hmm. Now, I've never experienced that with one of my patients, so I can't speak directly about that, but I'm not surprised by those anecdotal reports. Yeah. Those, those are clearly observations you can't make a scientific basis on it, but those are observations that 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 happened. But most people um, with some form of detoxification, which I believe should be supervised by someone who does detox, right. uh, they, they, they could notice uh, anywhere from uh, nine months uh, to a year and some uh, even longer. It depends on how much bioaccumulation they have. Okay. Well, that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so that this really brings me to a point where I, I need to keep some praise on to you. Uh, first of all, how much nutrition science is taught in dental school? We hear about how, how little is taught in medical school. How little is taught in dental school? Well, um, very little. I mean, you're challenging me to think back that far. <laughs> My point is, you learned all of this on your own. You took the time to study the science and look at nutrition and, you know, you understand the toxic load theory. You understand food as medicine. I mean, all of that comes along with this understanding of this deadly neurotoxin that we've been putting in our heads for over a hundred years. So well, I want to praise you for taking the initiative, not sitting still and going out here and learning this stuff and then standing up and taking a stand. Uh, as you say, we, you know, people that know this stuff have to st stand up and make it known. So good on you, sir. Well, thank you. And I'll, I'll throw a teaser out there to your audience. Um, one of the things that we can talk about sometime in the future is the metabolic uh, theory of uh, tooth decay, which involves the nutritional sciences. Uh, there, there are ways to stop and reverse uh, tooth decay. 
that's uh, that's a great teaser because that's actually a question I was going to ask, but I thought I might hold off. But uh, would this involve uh, oil pulling at all? Well, it, it could. Okay. Yes, it, it, it could. Um, but that would um, I mean, there's there's plenty of talk about. So let's let's just leave it a tease. Uh, yeah. Well, that's just a, that's a great tease, because, of course, uh, as I think the ADA says, once a cavity is a cavity, you can't un, you can't just fill it in by any natural means. Is that what they believe? Yes. Okay. We'll just leave it at that. That's really yes. good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark Bizzotto, DDS, uh, Dr. Mark, it's great to see you again. It's great having you here on the podcast. Uh, anything else you want to uh, share about this subject? Uh, and again, this is from our uh, latest issue, uh, article on mercury-free, mercury-safe dentistry. Uh, what's a parting thought for us on this subject? Well, just just the the reminder that th there is a difference between mercury free and mercury safe, and that uh, any any listener out there that uh, is curious, certainly if they're concerned about their potential exposure. exposure, 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 exposure to mercury and what it might mean to their bodies uh, should uh, take a look at the YouTube video on, on the smoking tooth. Go to the uh, International uh, Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology's website, iaomt.org. Uh, look at the information on Nutridentist.com. Um, there's, uh, th th there are many other resources and uh, go, go to your dental practitioner and question them. And, you know, I, unfortunately, I hear stories about how uh, some, uh, some of, of my new patients, they, they just get tired of arguing with, with their uh, practitioner. They just want to be protected. And uh, don't expect to uh, compel or persuade your practitioner uh, into this. This, this is... The, the, this this is a science in in the protection there there uh, and if when when you read the article you'll understand a little bit about why these things why these steps are t taken uh, but every one of us we're responsible for our own health we're responsible for protecting ourselves from the the toxic world we're responsible for feeding our bodies as nutritionally as as we know how. Uh, only a fool would rely on uh, the government and, and the agencies to, to protect ourselves. That's been unfortunately proven. Well, that's, uh, that's good advice, and uh, we are hopefully the gathering of the non-foolish right here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mark Mazzotto, it's great having you on today. Thanks very much.